And now may grace and mercy and peace be with you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello. Oh, there we go. Many years ago, while I was in high school, a group of friends would meet in the remodeled basement of one of our friends to enjoy each other's company, laugh, and occasionally delve into some deep discussion. One Friday evening, just after we had been given an assignment to write a paper on utopia, of all things, our discussion turned into a game to describe the most wonderful world we could imagine. Each of the seven of us would add an item to the list of what would make a more wonderful world, and only those items that got a majority vote could make it to the final list. I certainly don't remember all the dozens of items that we listed before we got totally off track, but here are a few that I do remember. Wouldn't it be cool if we could have some kind of a supercomputer that would fit in a room in our house and be able to hold like a whole library's worth of information? And another, could you imagine having a phone that was small enough to actually carry and could work from anywhere? We voted that down as totally impractical. There were the usual things you might expect. A world at peace with no need for nuclear bombs. Equality for women and black people. A time when all people would be able to get along with each other. Which brought up the need for something that we could carry that somehow could translate what someone who spoke another language was saying. Of course, we also thought of cars that could drive themselves or even fly, and some way of capturing the energy of the sun to power. That was a little more than 50 years ago. I'm pretty sure we haven't arrived at utopia. But some of the things that my friends and I thought were impossible dreams have been turned into reality, while plenty of others remain on our list. I find it helpful to remember that Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount to people who had little hope of a better world. Jesus' sermon is a description of a new kind of life, kingdom life. Jesus is trying to help us imagine what life looks like when we live according to God's will and according to God's rule. What is our God-centered dream for the future? It seems to me that Jesus does an amazing job of describing that new vision of life. So imagine with me a time when God is present and we live according to the logic of the kingdom. Strangely, it's not at all what it seems. The things that are called blessed do not align even remotely with a typical list of what we might consider blessed. For example, it includes those who are mourning, or those who are humble, or those to whom we ex extend mercy rather than exact revenge, or those who strive for peace rather than exert their will through violence, just to name a few. Author and translator Peterson wrote a Bible translation called The Message. And his version of the Beatitudes bring them into our everyday life. Let me read a few. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and God's rule. You're blessed when you feel like you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. And you're blessed 
when you've worked up a good appetite for God, for God is food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. Jesus calls many conditions we seek to avoid blessed. I think we tend to associate blessings in largely material terms, and Jesus' words stretch our imagination to see God present and at work in so many other and sometimes countercultural ways, particularly in our service to others, but also in the dark and the difficult times of life. I think that the imagined world of Jesus' sermon is a world of transformation. We're invited to transform our sense of where God is at work, not simply in places of strength, but in places of vulnerability, amid our grief, alongside those who exercise mercy and work for righteousness, and in so many other activities, the world considers not just meek, but actually weak. The God we know in Jesus always shows up where we least expect God to be, in a feeding trough in a stable rather than a jeweled crib in a palace, among the poor and destitute rather than with the rich and the powerful, and on the cross of an outlaw rather than astride the war horse of a conquering hero. And sure enough, our God shows up in our acts of sacrifice and mercy, rather through than the times when we assert our will and the times when we attempt to collect more and more stuff and strive to have more and more power. Jesus invites us to stretch our notions of what God's will means, what God's presence means. God doesn't promise to remove our grief, but rather transform it as we see in the resurrected Christ, the promise that God's love is more powerful than death, that therefore life rather than death will have the last word. Ten years ago, I, uh, my liver went bad. Nobody's 100% sure what happened, but nevertheless, that's exactly what, what the, the outcome was. And it was clear I was going to need a new one. But on the way to the hospital, I got extremely sick. And when, by the time I got to the emergency room, I am told by the nurse who told me long after it was over that I died twice. In the midst of that time, as I think back, I can remember being held, like a baby being held in its father's arms or cradled in his mother's arms. I can remember at some point crying out, I've done all these things wrong. It's terrible. I can't be with you. And while there were no words said, it was 100% clear to me that in this kingdom, it made no difference. For here was God's kingdom, just for a moment, just the flitter of an eye, And yet, it was the most beautiful place I have ever been. If you are grieving the death of someone who has gone to be with Jesus, worry not for them. It's the one and only place that I never wanted to come back from. God was kind enough to let me come back to see my grandchildren, and I'm so thankful for that. But I look forward to the day when again I can be in his presence directly. Where Jesus' love reigns in our lives, some of the things we choose can feel like small gestures, like being merciful in a world where some don't want to show any weakness and fear it will destroy us or working for justice in a world where there really isn't as much justice. 
And these are precisely the places where God is at work. Blessing, sustaining, supporting God's beloved children. In light of God's character and promises, there are no small gestures. We're reminded that nothing done in love, nothing done in Jesus' name, is ever lost or attempted in vain. But you and I know that we're not here living in some kind of perfect world where God's will and justice reign over all. And so those of us who are grieving losses of loved ones, of jobs, of livelihood, of hope, even of confidence in the future, in the midst of it all, we have chosen to follow God's kingdom promises. And God promises to transform our thoughts and our words and our deeds this Sunday and throughout these weeks and months. Right here in the midst of this pandemic, we've come out to shiver in the cold so we can worship God together. Right here in this pandemic, we have pledged to fill bags with food for those who are hungry in our city as we share our blessings with our neighbors. Right here in this pandemic, we will receive God's gift of forgiveness and new life by sharing communion in a way that is safe and protective to the most vulnerable among us. And as we do this, we are joined and we join ourselves to all the saints across the centuries, redeemed by the grace of the God we know in Jesus. For we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, surrounded by the saints who came before us, by those who taught the faith to us and showed us by example how to live even at times when the world is a mess. So with all those saints urging us on, we can allow God's kingdom promises to transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, not just today, but always. And when we allow the words of Jesus and the Spirit of God to enliven our imaginations, we join ourselves to all the saints across the centuries who have dreamed of a better world, a world redeemed and made whole by the God, grace of the God we know in Jesus. Blessed are those who believe that Jesus continues to beckon us into the vision of new life that God is leading us to embrace. In Jesus' name, amen.